Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your home for all things related to helping you on your journey to find an amazing job. Each episode, I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, graduate recruiters and career coaches who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute-ish show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had when I graduated. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast and today I have a cracker of a show for you and an inspiring one to boot as I speak with graduate recruitment expert, author and Netflix TV producer Andrew Osiemi who takes us through how his disastrous teenage love life will help you get a graduate job. In today's wide-ranging episode, Andrew shares his experiences from both sides of the graduate recruitment fence, and we discuss why getting on a graduate scheme is just like dating. We cover how getting a graduate job is like getting into a top nightclub, and the strategies you need to adopt to get into both. We explore why you need more than just good grades when you apply for graduate schemes and how playing poker led Andrew to career success. We delve into the skills you need to succeed in a job interview and why you should definitely be practicing your small talk skills and utilizing the power of telling stories. It's a fun episode and no matter what you're applying for, not one that you want to miss. As always, you can find a full transcript, including all of the show notes from today over at graduatejobpodcast.com slash dating. Now, before we get into the show today, let me tell you about my brilliant online course, cunningly titled How to Get a Graduate Job, which is open again for new members who want to turbocharge their hunt for a graduate job this year. Seven people joined the course last year, and I'm extremely proud to say that they all got graduate jobs, with most of them, as you will have heard from the previous five episodes with Sibra, Safi, Jack, Callum and Atavan, getting multiple offers. The course works. Check out episodes 115 to 119 to hear for yourself. Now, you might be wondering what is included. Well, it is yours truly, boiling down my nearly 20 years of graduate recruitment experience and 120 episodes of the show into 14 tutorial content across eight modules, which is 23 video tutorials where I go through everything. And I mean every aspect of the application process from getting ready to apply, the online application stage, creating a brilliant CV or cover letter, practicing recorded video interviews. Look, if you need to know it to get a graduate job, it is in there. And if you're quick, you can still sign up for my August special offer, including £375 of one-to-one coaching with yours truly, if you sign up before the 31st of August. That is five hours of one-on-one coaching with me, where you can practice recorded video interviews, get yourself ready for the assessment centers, get your CV perfect, whatever you want to cover. You've got five hours with me to use as you see fit. Now, this offer expires on the 31st of August, so don't hang about. Get yourself to howtogetagraduatejob.com and sign up now. 14 hours of video tutorial content I mentioned, handouts and cheat sheets galore, private members, Facebook groups and weekly webinars, which will be running every Tuesday night. And if you want proof this course works, just listen to my episode with my previous five guests where we go through how it worked for them and it will work for you too. That's howtogetagraduatejob.com and I look forward to you joining me in the course soon. Okay, let's jump in to my chat with Andrew. I'm pleased to welcome to the show today Andrew Osayemi, who is a Netflix TV show creator ex-financial markets trader and a graduate recruitment expert who has helped thousands of high potential students to get top internships and graduate jobs. Andrew, welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, I was wondering who you were talking about there. (laughs) (laughs) No, you've had a fascinating career to date podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, I was wondering who you were talking about there. (laughs) (laughs) No, you've had a fascinating career to date. Um, So you maybe want to give us a proper introduction of how you came to write your new book, How My Disastrous Teenage Love Life Will Get You an Internship, which we will discuss today. Yeah. um, Do you know what? It all started 
with 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 failure. It all started with failure. So I went out to schools. So I work in like you know graduate recruitment, trying to help students uh, get jobs. And I used to get sent to inner cities, inner city schools to talk about interviews. I remember going to the schools. You know, you turn up. You know, there's about 200, 300 kids in assembly, and you get up on stage and start talking about interviews. And I kid you not. After speaking about interviews for at least five seconds, people start talking with each other. They just don't want to know this. And I thought to myself, OK, let me go into my life and and test something. So the next school I went to, I turned up and I said to the people, you know, they said, oh, let's introduce Andrew Osiemi to come and talk about interviews. And I can already see their faces about to like, you know, to glaze over. And I stood up and said, you know, raise your hands if you um, have ever been in love and then you could hear a pin drop and then one person put their hand up another person nervously put their hand up and I spent the next hour with their full attention talking about my love life the issues I've had growing up as a teenager and um, and how I can help with how they can use that to help get them a job and the standing ovation I got at the end, I, the, one of the teachers came up to me and said, look, you need to write a book. And that was the emphasis of, OK, how do I get my some people? Excellent. And to be honest, I wish I'd had the book when I was applying for jobs. Uh, but also I wish I had the book when I was uh, a younger man dating as well. It would have been uh, it would have been useful. <laughs> <if that counts. laughs> And um, and today we're going to go through the book. Um, but listeners, as usual, you can find a full transcript and all the links that we discuss, including a link to the book, in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash dating. So let's maybe kick off with a comment from your friend Kay in the book, where he says, getting a job is the same as dating. It's all about getting someone to like you and to decide that you are worth investing in. Do you remember a bit more take us through here and uh, why, why Kay has a point? Yeah, no, Kay, Kay has a, a, a massive point. And just to give the, the listeners a bit of a backstory. So Kay is one of my like my best friends. He's my best friends. And he's someone that probably a lot of people knew growing up. You know, that person that, I mean, friends. And he's someone that probably a lot of people knew growing up. You know, that person that, I mean, whatever they did, they were just so lucky. They, they... They attracted um, like relationships and someone like myself, I wasn't outside looking in. You know, I couldn't I could not like in my wildest dreams get the same amount of love and attention that Kay that Kay did. So I thought it was all down to luck. But it was only when I spoke to Kay and he told me that, no, that he's been rejected so many times from, you know, from potential like women he's interested in that he's literally had to like, you know, toughen up and practice at, at, at like trying to find the love of his life essentially. And like, you know, you have to do the same for an interview. So he gave me an analogy, like you said, that, you know, it's all about interviews is all about second date. If you get to the second round where people are kind of sizing each other up, seeing, will you fit into this organization? And you're also trying to do the same as well, thinking, mm -hmm would I fit in as well? And that's, I think, essentially what interviews are all about. Definitely. And um, you, know, you, you talk with lots of uh, really fun anecdotes uh, throughout the book about your, your dating life, and we'll, we'll touch on some of those uh, later on. So maybe then starting with chapter one, which is about doing your research. Why is it so key when you're looking for a graduate job to make sure that you are doing your research properly? Do you know what I, I find is that, like... I remember being a graduate. I remember being a graduate, right? And you would, uh, I went to University of Warwick and we used to have loads of firms come down and essentially pitch themselves to us. And what you would like like do as, you know, as uh, and it's quite common, you just apply to all of them just because you're like, oh my God, I need a job. I need a, like, oh my God, I need a job. I need a job. Yep. Um, but if you don't do your research, when you get to interview or even to try and get to interview, but even when you try and craft your CV or cover letter, you will struggle to actually like figure out whether or not this job is for you or whether or not they would like you as well. So doing your research will save you so much time 
Um, I remember, and I think I discussed it in the book, where you know I remember a young a young a young, a young lady. She 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 found me at a wedding. Um, you know, I was trying to tuck into the buffet, like you know, she was desperate. <laughs> I was like, you know, she's like, Andrew, could, I mean, can you give me some advice? And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm 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 just here to have fun. But there was something in her eyes, and she was trying to get into accountancy, and she didn't realize because she hadn't done her research that they look as far back as GCSE and maybe like your best grades in particular. Yeah. And and she had failed that. And um, by just doing that bit of research and her knowing that, she was able to go back and rectify that by retaking that her maths, her maths, her maths degree. So or maths, her maths A, I mean GCSE. So it's all about if you do your research, it will save you so much time to get to the end goal of where you want to get to. Definitely. And otherwise, you know, you could be sending off these applications and just wondering why you're not getting anywhere. And it's because you're not meeting one of the key criteria that's down in the small print later on that you need a C or above or whatever it might exactly. be in, in maths. Yeah, exactly. And in the book, you, you talk about your first interview at Goldman Sachs when you were applying for a, a role there. Can you tell us about this example and what went wrong in that one? Yeah. So, again, this is another one where um, I was first of all, I was lucky to get the interview. Whereas I got the interview through like a social mobility scheme, you know, a scheme to help people from disadvantaged backgrounds, which was good and bad for you through like a social mobility scheme, you know, a scheme to help people from disadvantaged backgrounds, which was good and bad. It was good because I got the interview. It was bad because I had no clue who Goldman Sachs were. Um, <laughs> when someone said to me, um, you know, you're going for a banking interview, and that's what I was told. You're going for a banking interview. I was under the impression that it was like a retail bank because growing up, when someone mentioned bank, you thought it was something that you saw on the high street. So I had no idea what an investment bank was. So I rock up to the interview, you know, I'm there early, I'm on time, I'm looking good. But I'm essentially thinking this interview is about being a bank manager or a cashier and I'm giving it my best pitch. And they're looking at me like, is this guy for real? Um, does he actually know what investment banking is? And to be honest, it was one of my, I think it's my shortest interview ever. I think it lasted about five to 10 minutes before oh, wow. I got let go. And it was essentially just for things. Uh, I remember speaking to a student again, and they were applying to Rolls Royce, but they were thinking that it was Rolls Royce, the car company. But Rolls Royce had actually sold the car business to another firm years ago. And they were, they just, Rolls Royce now just focuses on like, um, like creating like, um, machinery for airplanes and stuff like that so again they rock up thinking they're talking about cars and 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 you know car fashion but it's about engineering so doing your research and knowing what you're talking about is so important definitely that's uh, otherwise you know you're going to make an impression but for the wrong reasons at the interview yeah. stage and I liked it in the book, your analogy you mentioned about trying to get into nightclubs when you were younger and how you only managed to really get in by getting there as soon as they opened and uh, getting in at, say, 10 o'clock when they opened. Um, but you talk about how this strategy is the same one you need for internships. In, um, but you talk about how this strategy is the same one you need for internships and in applying as soon as they open. Why, why do you think this is the case? Yeah, so this is something I never knew before about rolling versus fixed deadlines. So, and and you can completely understand, like if you're in a HR department, you open your application on Monday um, and you're gonna close in four weeks time. If you start screening applications in four weeks time, that's a lot of work. Like, you know, why not, as soon as applications come in, you start screening and you start interviewing. Yeah. And that's what happens at a lot of firms. Uh, within the first week, they're already screening and um, they're ready interviewing. But what that does is that benefits people who are super researched, super keen, which let's face it, majority of students are not. You know, we're still looking around, trying to figure out what's the best thing for them. And it does disadvantage things for them. And it does disadvantage students who throughout the summer didn't do their research and really figured out what they wanted to do. So my advice I always give to students is spend the summer researching. But as soon as the milk round starts, you know, in early September, you need to get your applications in as soon as possible to stand a chance. I completely agree. And as you mentioned in that example, you know, if you're 
one of the first applications that it opens on a Monday and you manage to get your application in on a Tuesday or Wednesday. You're probably one of a handful of people that's going to apply. You yeah. think then about the the final days of the application process. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds of applications coming through. So it just becomes so much more difficult to stand out when you're one of 300 as opposed to one of five. That's right. And every firm tells me that on the last day, something always goes wrong with technology. <laughs> it could be the graduate site crashes or something happens. And that's because so many people are applying on the last station or, or doesn't get through due to some kind of technical difficulty. Exactly. And, you know, if you're talking in your CV and cover letter about how, you know, you've got great time management and project management skills or whatever it might be, but then you're applying at the last minute, then it doesn't really correspond with what you're talking about in your CV. So, you know, make sure you are getting it in as, as early as possible, but still making sure it's high quality. But yeah, the earlier, the better. Absolutely. Definitely. So let's move on to chapter two in the book then, which is about being more interesting. Why is this crucial when you look for work? Yeah, especially, I mean, I think nowadays um, there's so many people going to uni. There's so many people. So it is so hard to stand out. Um, there's like for every job, I mean, you can only imagine how many applications are per, for every available job. So as as you, as an applicant, you want like from even you want like from even just someone looking at your CV to be like, oh, my God, this person is so interesting. I just need to bring them in just to talk about what they've written on their CV. This is amazing. And then when you get to interview, you want to be able to say the same things in such an engaging and interesting manner that they leave the interview thinking, oh, my God, I need to we need to hire this person in some kind of fashion. This person is amazing. They're memorable. They're special. Let's hire them. If you don't, and I think this is what happens to a lot of students, if you if you strip away your personality and you just rely on your academic performance, unfortunately, there is so many people just like you yep. that you will not stand out. So you have to go into your personality and your experiences and be proud and, and be able to talk about them with confidence. Definitely. And with people who get first, who almost think, yeah, I've got a first. Boom, that's it. Don't need to do, don't need anything else. Don't need work experience. Don't need to talk about anything else. You know, the first is good enough. And it's not, you know, you, you, companies, as you said, they want to see a rounded candidate. They want to see that you've done other interesting things. Um, so you can't be relying on on just your just your degree because it's not going to cut the mustard. Yeah, and I think, and, and I think, unfortunately, you know, um, students that come from like evil working class backgrounds or like disadvantaged background suffered the most because the parents of those students are constantly focused on the wrong things they're like get a first get a first get a first like you know don't don't do any extra work just focus on getting on a first and i really really like i really really feel for those students who 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 do get the first but they they just have no employability skills at all and no employability skills at all and they find it very, very difficult. And those students just end up staying in academia and going on to do a master's and PhD. Yep. When if they had done a little bit, just a tiny little bit of work experience, they would have they would have done a lot better and got ahead in life. Definitely. And I was reviewing a CV last week and in the hobbies and interests section at the bottom of the CV, the candidate had put, um, you know, hobbies include like watching TV and <laughs> reading. And I was saying to them, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about things which are interesting, which you, yeah. know, you do that are interesting, that someone's going to read and go, oh, wow, that's, you know, yeah, well, I really want to talk to them about, about that. And it doesn't have to be that you've walked across Africa for charity or mm. you know, done something huge. It's just, you know, just be honest, but, but make, make sure it's interesting. Watching TV and reading isn't interesting, right? You know, you might as well yeah, say yeah. I enjoy breathing regularly at uh, the Harry Potter Society at university, whatever it might be, to something which gives you a chance to build rapport with someone you're speaking to later on, because there's something, a hook to give them that they'll be like, oh yeah, tell us about, you know, tell us about DJ that. or yeah. whatever it might yeah. be. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember, and this is going back years ago, on my CV, I had professional poker player. And every interview I went to, they were like, um, tell us more about this professional poker player. 
and I and I would go in and talk about how you know playing poker at uni, I'd been able to pay for my university, um, pay for any fees, didn't have to work, and it was just that one thing. They were like, no one ever has put professional poker player on their CV, um, and that's why we're interviewing you today. So yeah, you're right, absolutely. Those hobbies and interests are crucial to to get in an interview. Oh wow! So uh, listeners, yeah, chance to uh, to dust down those uh, playing cards and uh, yeah, start playing uh, start playing poker. But um, do you do you still play? No. Oh wow! So uh, listeners, yeah, chance to uh, to dust down those uh, playing cards and uh, yeah, start playing uh, start playing poker. But um, do you do you still play? No, 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 no. Uh, unfortunately, I just um, the wife won't allow me to play poker anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but no, I mean, I, I mean, and when I mean I don't play, I don't play it as professionally as I did. I, but I do play it, like you know, recreationally. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all fun and games and testing your, 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 your skills really. Definitely, especially you know, and when you you're applying for investment banking and you know quantitative roles, there's just so much you can talk about with poker in terms of probability and things like that. So it's um, you know, it's a really good link to the roles that you're applying for, but. Yeah, no, it was. And the funny thing, and you you raise a really good point, and it, it was because of playing poker, actually. I remember our poker society in, in in Warwick. I used to play poker, and then they said, Andrew, I mean, why don't you apply to trading? Because, you know, the skills that you, you use in poker would be really good for trading. So sometimes your hobbies can lead you to the thing or the professional, the career that you want to go into. So not i mean not talking about them you were you're missing an opportunity for you to actually find your why and what you really want to do in your life no that's a really good point so maybe sticking with the interesting angle you talk in the book about small talkers letting you down on dates in the past um and you link to why it's so important in job interviews why why should candidates be thinking about their small talk skills do you know what it's, it's all about the energy it's all about energy and i mean i'm sure like you've been there, you know, you met someone for the first time and like the first few seconds or the first few minutes almost de- 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 I mean, depict your, your impression of them. Definitely. And, and it's all about energy. If someone, if you meet someone that's like bubbly, full of energy, that's like bubbly, full of energy, interesting, asking you loads of questions, not afraid to talk about their day in the beginning of an interview, the first minute, you're instantly going to warm to them and be like, OK, this person is interesting this person is enthusiastic i want this person on the team if you meet someone who's a bit cold um is a bit nervous um doesn't doesn't warm up throughout the throughout the interview gives one or two line answers um like void of any personality you just uh, the impression is literally just going to be a bit like uh I don't know what it's about. I don't know what it is about that person, but I, I don't think they're going to fit into the team. Yep. So, so working on your small talk, I, I coach people to have like two or three random stories they can talk about at the beginning of an interview. Um, like I, 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 I give advice for the, the, uh, the person who's um, the interviewee to calm down the interviewer, you know, like make them feel at ease rather than uh, most times the interviewer is trying to, make the interviewee feel at ease but i say you know reverse the role you take control of the interview make the person feel at ease by being so warm and friendly and confident in the beginning yep no i love that and uh, a key word from what you said for me that stood out was um was positive i can remember from um doing a telephone interview back in the day where you know, you can bring someone up um, who's applying for a role with a management consultancy and, you know, you try and have a bit of small talk, ask them how the day was. And one candidate was, oh, yeah, you know, I missed the bus and it was, you know, it was raining and this was going, well, this went wrong and this went wrong and, you know, oh, this went wrong. And immediately I was just stuck with, wow, this person is really, really negative. And, yeah. you know, in terms of energy, it just gets off on the, on the, on the wrong foot. And, at the end of the day, with when you're doing interviews, the fundamental question interviews, the fundamental question you're always asking yourself is, would I want to work with this person? Would I want to be sat next to them for eight hours a day? And when you come across people who are just really Debbie Downers, the answer is not really. Yeah, no, it's true. It's very true. So let's move on then to chapter three, which is about being able to back it up. How is this relevant when you're looking for work? I mean, like I said earlier, 
there's so many people looking for jobs at the moment. So there's so many people who are prepped. There's so many people who are um, like can 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 talk talk for 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 hours. But there's only a few people who can actually back it up, you know. And that's the key thing. Um, what you really want to exp- like to really give the sense of to an interviewer is that you, like you're charming, you're fun, you're interesting, but you've actually done stuff. Um, and when you when you, like you know you can't just say it, you have to prove it. And it's that is the thing that employers are looking for most importantly, just to say, okay. Is this person for real? I I almost look at interviews sometimes as as uh, interviewers as being they're almost like a detective yep. because they're trying to pick out. Everyone's gonna say you know I'm the best person for the role, so they're, they're throwing you these kind of like interrogation questions just to just to really think and decide are you for real and providing evidence, providing examples backs up the fact that you actually for real and you're a good person for the job. Completely. And you, you see this with CVs or poor quality CVs where people just have this laundry list of skills where, mm-hmm. you know, I am hardworking, I'm dedicated, I'm creative, I'm whatever it might be. And there's nothing to back it up. So you look at it and you think, well, you know, how do I know that you're all of these things? So you, and it's the same in interviews, you're able to back it up with an example of where you've demonstrated the particular skill or competency or strength um, and just to show people that, you know, I'm not making this up. Um, I'll make it easy for you. You don't need to do the de- detective work because I'm telling you the ex- specific time that I've developed this skill. And um, yeah, it just makes it so much easier for the interviewer. Yeah. And it's like dating, right? It's like dating, you know, <laughs> on the first date or the second date or, or or however long dates it takes for someone to get to know. They're asking you these questions, isn't it? They're trying to find evidence. You know, are you a good boyfriend? Are you a good girlfriend? Yep. Um you know, like, you know, how many, how many, like, marriages have you had? Like, have you been divorced? <laughs> you know, how many kids have you got? Like, they're, they're, all these kind of questions are just there to say, because everyone goes into a, a dating situation, like, you know, I'm the perfect partner for you. Yep. But they're really trying to see, can you back it up? And that's, that's really what we're trying to get to with, with students in these, in the student scenarios. Definitely. So let's move on then to chapter four. That's really what we're trying to get to with, with students in these in the student scenarios. Definitely. So let's move on then to chapter four, uh, which is you need to have a why you story. Can you mm. tell us what a why you story is and why it is important? Yeah, with a why you story, I I I strongly believe, and at one point in time in an interview, they're gonna stop and say, okay. So pitch, pitch to us. Why should we hire you? Yep. And they, and they can answer that. They can answer that question. Ask that question in a manner of different ways. It could be how do you stand out from your peers? Like yep. what's special about you? Uh, why should we hire you? Uh, um, you know what, what? How how are you? How can you demonstrate you're going to bring value to the team? But essentially, they're all the same thing. They're asking you why you, and it's that's the time for you to pitch. And what I say to people is this is an important thing. A chance for you to leave an impression. Speaking to someone, and someone said to me, um, "I said, why? Why should we? Why should we hire you?" And they said to 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 me, "Like you should hire me because of the fact that I, I came as a stowaway from Afghanistan, and I had to travel across 15 different countries to come to the UK." And I was like, "Wow!" No one else had ever said that to me. It resonated in my mind. It stuck, and just of that simple story demonstrated so much skills of that person must have and I thought wow that 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 is impressive you know that is something I'm going to take into consideration of why I should hire this person but if you just if you just say you should hire me because um um um, I've got great attention to detail I'm hard working and I'm a lovely guy um a million other people are going to say that so you need to find your why you story which makes you stand out from the crowd. I love that. And we're going to say that. So you need to find your why you story, which makes you stand out from the crowd. I love that. And stories are so powerful. I mean, they're so much, so much, so much more memorable and yeah. people remember stories and you want the recruiter to remember you for the right reasons. Um, so if you can tell stories, well, completely agree. It's a, um, it's a really good tool in your arsenal. Yeah, Definitely. So let's move on to the final chapter of the book, which is practice, review and repeat. So 
I love this approach. Could you expand on why it is crucial to adopt as you look for work? It's simply because, and, and this is for anyone listening, um, because you're not going to be the finished product at the beginning. You know, you need to put yourself out there. You need to practice, like, you know, review your performance and definitely repeat it. And I, I, I mean, and it's happened to me many times in my life. And, and it's, it's for whatever goal you have, be perfect. I remember when I, like, I left bank and I went into the TV production and my first pilot I made, I thought it was amazing and it was going to get me, like, you know, ITV, BBC, all the, um, all the TV, uh, companies chasing me for me to produce it and absolutely none of them was interested and it was only when I reviewed the pilot I went back I dissected it looked at what was wrong got feedback from others took it on board and then recrafted it remade it completely changed the cast changed the themes um, that was only when I was able to get better and ultimately which led me to selling my, my show to Netflix in the end so you have to take the same approach with interviews. Um, and that would probably revolve around, you know, you doing mock interviews with your friends and then actually going out to doing interviews with firms uh, and not being discouraged if you if you get a re- work on it, improve. And through that mindset, you will get a, you will get a job of your dreams. I love that. It's about, you know, taking the, the setbacks you face and the rejections you face and, you know, analysing it, learning from it and then improving. And if you keep doing that, you will, you know, you're guaranteed to get there in the end. So that's a really, really nice point for us to to finish the main part of the interview on, Andrew. Um, so where can people uh, watch your Netflix series? Is it on Netflix in the UK? Yeah, it's on Netflix in the UK. So, I mean, like to share people about my, like, you know, my, my Netflix journey was... Um, I, I grew up in the UK, so uh, so I'm from Nigerian descent. So born and raised in the UK, parents are from Nigeria, um, and then, and that is one in my eyes. Growing up in my in my household, there was a lot of comedy because my parents didn't understand British culture. I didn't really understand Nigerian culture, and as as I got older, and as as I got older, I thought to myself, why? Is there not a show that represents like my upbringing and can share that with the world? So I decided to leave banking, raise some money, and I put all my time and energy into making this TV show. And like you said, through ups and downs, through a lot of rejections, through a lot of disappointments, we were finally able to, uh, two years ago, sell the series to, to Netflix. So it's called Meet the Eddie Banjos, and it has over 50 episodes. So feel free to go and enjoy on Netflix. Excellent. And I will link to those in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash dating. So maybe a final question before we move on to the weekly staple questions. So Andrew, your background is in investment banking and you've worked in the city and with rare recruitment, you help recruit graduates into the city. Um, what advice would you give people who are looking for a job in the city? My main advice I'll give is that you have to be tough you have to be resilient. You have to have, have thick skin. Working in the city is a lot of pressure. You've got a lot of um, people that are high strung, very determined, full of energy and will do whatever it takes to win. So if you're going into that environment, you have to be like the same. You have to be tough. You have to be resilient. You, you will go. You will face challenges as everyone will because it's such a tough industry. But if you have a thick skin and you're resilient, resilient and you're determined, that like you will definitely win. It's a hard job. Um, it's a lot of hours. It takes a lot out of you. So be prepared, mentally prepared to be tough and resilient and you will do really, really well. I like that. And if you've got a strong enough reason why why you want the job, um, then it'll be it'll be enough to see you through all the it'll be it'll be enough to see you through all the the difficulties and the hardship and the long hours and the, whatever else you might face um, trying to get a job. But yeah, if you've got a strong enough reason why, it will see you through. Definitely. So Andrew, let's move on to our weekly staple questions. So question number one: What one book would you recommend that listeners should read? Yeah, um, good question. So one book I recommend is probably the 10x rule. 10x rule, I think it's by a person called Grant Cardone. 
Um, it's all about, and it really helped me in my life, is thinking 10 times bigger on any goal that, 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 that you have, that, that, that you're currently thinking about. And what I mean by that is, say, for example, you're thinking about owning um, a business. Uh, why not think about owning 10 businesses? Say, for example, you're thinking about setting up a business uh, or you're setting up uh, a charity that deals with the UK. Why not think bigger? And it really helped me along my life journey around how to think bigger and not to think small. So The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone is a good book to read. Excellent. And we talked earlier about energy. And if you if you like uh, if you like audiobooks, then definitely check out because uh, Grant Cardone does his own audiobook, and he yeah. is a high energy individual. So uh, definitely one to to check out there. So I will link to that in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash dating. And next question then, Andrew, what one website or internet resource would you point listeners towards? If it's for graduates, I personally think um, that the best one. And it's going to sound a bit like boring and cliche. It's probably BBC, BBC Business. You know, it really gives you an overview of what's going on in the world, in the economy, in corporate, in corporate life, just so that you have stuff to talk about when you go in for an interview. And in the world, in the economy, in corporate, in corporate life, just so that you have stuff to talk about when you go in for an interview. Like staying up to date with what's going on in current affairs. And in the business world will really, really help you and make you more commercial, uh, improve your commercial awareness. So just bbc.co.uk, um, uh, I think it's a great place to, to stay up to date with. That's a good tip there. And commercial awareness is key, especially if you're going into the city, if you're going for a career in law. Commercial awareness is something that they will make sure that you uh, you are well versed on. So excellent tip there. And final question today, Andrew, what one tip would you give listeners that they can implement today to help them on their job search? One tip I would give is join an organization called Toastmasters. Um, Toastmasters is all about improving your public speaking. If there's anything that you could do to really improve your chances is it will get a job. What holds a lot of people back is the fact that they can't articulate, they can't communicate and they can't express, you know, how good they are. Um, and, and it's mainly because of it's something you just don't practice. You know, people just think, you know, you're just going to get better at it. But I was faced with the same situation a few years ago where you know, I was going out to do business pitches and I just felt flat. I felt like I wasn't able to communicate. I joined um, Toastmasters, which is like a public speaking organization. And I think it costs like four pounds a, a, a month. So really cheap, really cheap. But it that drastically improved my communication skills. So, yeah, if there's one tip, join Toastmasters or any public speaking organization and you will get better and, and you'll get your dream job. That's great advice and a tip which will you know if you improve your public speaking skills it's something that is going to stay with you throughout you know if you improve your public speaking skills it's something that is going to stay with you throughout your entire life and yeah it will help you more than you would know especially as you go for graduate jobs when you have to do a presentation and you have no nerves because you know you've been adept at speaking in front of lots of people speaking in front of one person is not going to hold any fear at all so that is really excellent advice there andrew so thank you so much for appearing on the graduate job podcast today andrew what is the best way that people can get in touch with you and the work that you do yeah no thank you so much james for having me um if you want to get in touch with me the best way is on linkedin um just search andrew osiemi on linkedin um i'm always on there i'm happy to talk happy to give you advice and you know my message to you is just like just keep at it i know it this with covid and everything going on the market is tough um, but like, you know, if you utilize like what we talked about today, like you will be in the best chance or the best place possible to get your dream job. Andrew, thank you so much for appearing on the show. Thank you so much, James. Many thanks to Andrew for his time today. A fun episode and a really inspiring guy. He set himself the goal of a career in investment banking and he did it. Then a complete change of direction for creating his own TV show and selling it to Netflix. And he did that as well. And you work hard. 
and I'm hoping to get him back on the show to discuss his current venture, Rare Recruitment, who work with companies to help them attract high-achieving graduate talent from diverse and social mobility backgrounds. So stay tuned for that one. And again, as a reminder, links to everything we discussed today, including a full transcript over at graduatejobpodcast.com slash dating. And another reminder, if you are serious about getting a graduate job, you still have time to get yourself onto the How to Get a Graduate Job course. This course takes you through everything you need to know and to do to get on a graduate scheme. It covers all of the different stages from getting ready to apply for graduate schemes, from the CV, cover letter, online applications, recorded video interviews, assessment centres, negotiating offers, dealing with rejection and much, much more. It's got 14 hours of video content where I take you through everything you need to know, take you through everything you need to know and to do. It's got handouts galore, cheat sheets, example CVs and cover letters, and it comes with a private Facebook group for just you, me and the other course members, and also a weekly webinars where we go through different topics every week. If you want to get a graduate job, this is the course you need. And for the month of August, so you've got to be quick, I'm offering a special offer. Buy before the 31st of August and get five hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching with me worth £375 included. That's five hours to spend how you want. We could do five hours of recorded video practice or you can spend it on the CV, getting ready for the assessment centre. It's entirely up to you. But this special offer is only good till midnight on the 31st of August, so don't delay. Go to howtogetagraduatejob.com and sign up now you won't regret it. So episode 120 is done.